God's doing some awesome things in this region, and our series is Church on Fire, week four, part four, and um, I've decided to be a little teachy today, so I'm going to sit down and relax and try not to get all blown out of shape, uh, because I'm more excited about this than almost any subject around. The ecclesia, the age of the church that began, the called out ones, called out of darkness, God's final end game, God's final people group, people created in his image with his Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, representing his son inside of each one, and all together making up a many-membered body all throughout the world that would represent Jesus, who he was, and demonstrate it through their lives and actions. We see on Pentecost uh, the birth of the New Testament church. Uh, the age of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, came. And um, I'm really excited about this series because I want each one of us, and the reason I'm sitting down, I'm, I'm looking at this today like a giant Sunday school class, like we're just sitting here studying our roots and our history because every one of us, if you're a born-again believer, these are your roots. It goes back to this. In fact, the Bible says if you are Christ's, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. It goes all the way back to the patriarchs. To, to, so to see the unfolding plan through the Old Testament and into the New Testament and into the birth of the church, I want us to know our roots. The other thing the Holy Spirit made very clear to me uh, while I was praying before the message this morning is that he is going to speak words, words of release, words of direction, Tumblers are going to fall into place with things in your life that are on hold, that you're wondering, hmm, things are going to, there's all kinds of connects going to be made by the Holy Spirit during this message that I can't do beyond anything I say. He's out there working. He told me one other thing that amazed me before the service. He said this morning during this message, just during our time together, he's going to call young men and women, boys and girls, young ones, young ones, to dedicate their life and be sold out to the kingdom of God. He's going to do something in your hearts, supernatural, that he does, and you just need to respond and say, yes, Lord, yes, I will. So here's what happened. He gave me that so clear. I was driving down Indian Lakes Road, and I remember right where it was, what field I was looking at when the Holy Spirit hit me with that. But then in the first service, I had a lot to do. We were behind time, and I forgot completely about it. Completely. But the Holy Spirit didn't. This is interesting, and a confirmation that it was the Holy Spirit. I walk into the office, and my son Carter walks in and says, Dad, Dad, Dad. He says, something happened to me during the church service. He says, it was like my heart was on fire. He said, it was exploding and just burning inside of me. He said, it's just all during the service that happened. And so then I explained to him what that was. I says, you're already set apart, but now you're like you're doubly or triply set apart. Uh, the Holy Spirit's calling you to dedicate your life completely to his kingdom, mission, and purpose. There's a bubble of grace around you to help you become a man of God, a better man of God than I am, and do greater works and do awesome things. That was the Holy Spirit setting you apart in a whole new level. And he goes... Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> he just stared at me like, here's the thing. The Holy Spirit did it anyhow, even though I didn't say anything. And so I'm doubly bringing it up to you young people today. The Holy Spirit is doing something cool in these services today, setting some of you apart and calling you very specifically. And your lives will never be the same, and you're going to live a set-apart life and uh, do awesome things. Uh, so as we talk about, we're talking about our roots here, and I want us to understand that this, we're talking about the first 17 years of the New Testament church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the, the church, its birth and its expansion. And remember, Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. 
So far, what we've discussed is the explosive New Testament birth of the church, 3,000 people saved on the day of Pentecost. Shortly thereafter, Peter heals the lame man at the gate, beautiful. He's jumping around. They bring him and have a transformation service. 2,000 more people get saved. And it says now the number of those who believe was 5,000 people. That didn't count women and children. So there are probably 10, 12,000 people already just like that the 12 apostles are going nuts trying to figure out how to set life groups house churches apart and how to just uh, do this thing we see the explosive growth of the church as it moves into houses all through the city from house to house they're breaking bread they're small groups intimately worshiping god relating to each other sharing all their stuff having everything in common temple worship is displaced heavily fair quite heavily because they're worshiping and having communion uh, all over the city and so we see this kind of thing going on and then uh, we see more things happen uh, uh, things keep on going and after a while probably after about several more years there are up to I'm fast forwarding 25,000 believers in a one square mile city that probably had a little less than a quarter of a million people and probably a little less than a 170,000 they say after all the travelers from the festival left so probably 20 percent of the population literally turned their lives over to Christ it freaked out all the religious leaders like crazy they saw Judaism slipping from their grasp they saw the temple worship that being compromised it was freaking them out and they decided it's time to persecute this thing it's time to stop it and so they decided to call one of the deacons by the way during this period of time also the first eight years I'm talking about we see the emergence of the of the fivefold ministry we see the emergence of the apostles which is are the master builders uh, commissioned by Christ to build the church in the ministry of the evangelist Philip the evangelist who goes to Samaria preaches to the whole city the city gets saved demons get cast out people get healed and and literally the whole city's on fire for God like flipping out this and then Philip the evangelist who is basically evangelist is called to preach the good news and literally reap harvest of souls next he ends up out in the middle of the desert with the Ethiopian eunuch by the Holy Spirit he talks to him and the guy gets radically saved and baptized in water by the way I've been in the Middle East I've been in India I've been around I met I met powerful believers from Ethiopia and Christian leaders who told me about the explosive early church move that happened in Ethiopia as a result of this eunuch and how it went on and on and to this very day there's a strong central powerful move uh, in Ethiopia based on this next um, you know Philip doesn't have a four-wheel drive car he doesn't have an explorer or uh, anything he's way out in the middle of the desert and the Holy Spirit goes I'm moving quick I gotta move him so he just picks Philip up drags him 27 miles down the coast in the spirit he travels and he drops him off in Azotus he he's walking in the desert one moment down our dusty road thinking man I got a two-day walk ahead of me the next minute he's walking into a restaurant a minute later in Azotus how cool was that sounds a little flaky but it happened and um, and so uh, we see the emergence of the, the evangelist. We see supernatural events like this as the Holy Spirit put in the fast lane the development and growth of the New Testament church. We see the emergence of the prophet Agabus who prophesied uh, of a big famine coming and the whole church uh, just uh, followed that and they were saved from great, great uh, problematic as they all had each other's back. We see all these ministries, the fivefold ministry, uh, emerged during this first period of time. Uh, Stephen, then all of a sudden, with all this explosive growth, the apostles can't handle it anymore. They appoint deacons. They call the seven anointed men, Stephen being the chief of them. And of course, he's doing signs and wonders and miracles while he's delivering food and groceries to the to the widows and doing all the other things. And finally, the religious people go, we got to get a handle on this thing. So they just grab Stephen and they, they just drag him in and, and, and said, hey, you guys got to stop this thing. And you know what he does? Stephen goes on uh, a, a powerful message. He doesn't defend himself. He holds court like Peter did. Instead of 3,000 people getting saved, the opposite happens. They decide we're going to kill this guy. And Stephen is killed, and he becomes the first martyr. The first martyr. And now what happens is persecution. As Saul of Tarsus, a witness, is there and, and, and watching this whole thing, they kill Stephen. And that day, it says, that very day, 
a giant persecution arose and it says the church literally blew out of Jerusalem they fled to the four they just fled in every direction to get out of there because they were getting dragged out of their houses and uh, here's what happened um, there were over a hundred towns in Judea and Samaria that whole region okay over a hundred small villages and towns and it says they scattered everywhere preaching the word and over the next four years churches house churches and small churches appeared in all these towns and villages and so now not only jerusalem is full of the gospel and full of believers but all the small towns all these believers are everywhere setting up small churches in all these villages and towns all the way from jerusalem through judea and into samaria we see the gospel spreading like wildfire but what happened during this thing uh, how did that happen believers who were completely uh, uh, displaced of their incomes, their assets, their lifestyles, their routines, their comfort zones. Everything got shook up and moved around as these people were blown out of their comfort zone, but ended up finding new life, new footholds of grace in different environments. And the church grew and multiplied like crazy. And the first words of Jesus came true. By the way, we in this modern day are doing the same thing we're in three different towns now a number of a number of us a number of you and a number who have gone and a number who are still here are all saying you know what i see the big picture of what god wants to do here he doesn't just want to touch just this one area he wants to touch other regions and other locales and there will be more and when that happens god's going to take some who are here who had never thought of being pastors and make you pastors some of you who had never thought of being life group leaders of a small house church group you're going to become that some of you who had never given financially to give behind something like this and make it possible for others as they give it are going to jump into this mix we're doing the same thing we're affecting three communities now and i expect us to do much more of that but it requires some sacrifice it requires displacement routines friendships relationships uh, even our assets all disrupted but when we go all in with god and say hey god it's going to look a little different than it did then i don't want 36 people living in my house don't tell me to do that God and but there is a surrender to God in this modern day and age where we go all in and he can do awesome things with us if we're open to it and so uh, uh, during this time of course temple worship is displaced completely just and we recall the words of Jesus to the Samaritan woman when she said should we worship at the temple over here in Samaria or the one in Israel which is the right one and Jesus said in John 4 23 the hour is coming and has now come where the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth you can go sit in somebody's house and have a worship there you don't need to go to the temple anymore temple worship was displaced and uh, uh, so as this all happened now approximately 12 years have gone by 12 years have gone by and we see the Jerusalem line of churches established on the foundations of the patriarchs Israel Moses and the prophets and then Christ we see the Jerusalem line exploding in Jerusalem going to Judea and going to Samaria and we say, wow 12 years has gone by there's only one thing listening only one thing missing from the line of the Great Commission yet and that is Jesus final statement the uttermost parts of the earth the Holy Spirit was about to shift the church into a new gear called outside the box and we're gonna see the emergence I want to talk about the emergence of the Gentile church in an explosive moment in history that affects you and me because we're all Gentiles unless you're a Jew a Gentile is anybody who's not a Jew um, Acts 10 verse 9 through 16 Peter's on a rooftop in Joppa. He's getting hungry, and uh, he, has a, he has a moment with God here. Verse 9, uh, it says, Around noon the following day, as they were on the journey approaching the city, that's the three guys who were going to get Peter because Cornelius had had a vision in another town who was a Roman centurion and gave tithes and alms. He was a Gentile, and an angel appeared to him and said, You need to go get Peter. You know what I like about that? The, Holy, the angel didn't give him the good news. He says, I want to use a man. I need to use a man because that's how God works. He says, go send for Peter. So they come looking for him. Meanwhile, Peter's up on a roof praying, and he became very hungry and wanted something to eat. That happens to me every time I start praying or fasting. 
in that respect, I am like Peter. And the other respect, I got my foot shoved halfway down my throat half the other time. And, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Verse 11, the heaven opened and something like a large sheet let down by the four corners contained all kinds of four-footed animals, reptiles, birds. And a voice said, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, said Peter. His famous line, no. Jesus said something, he goes, no. He's done it before and he's doing it again. He says, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time, don't call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then the sheet was taken back up to heaven, and it goes on to say, Peter just wondered, what was that? What is that? I feel for Peter, because get this, God literally showed him a picture of something, everything you weren't supposed to touch, and said, now I want you to touch it, because it's cool, it's good. There's a new dimension, there's a new thing coming, and what wasn't cool before with the law and all its ceremonies, and there was a reason for it. Now he's telling you, you can do it? Peter was just conflicted. By the way, he was doubly conflicted being a Jew. He knew this happened three times. He denied Jesus three times with intensity. He had been forgiven and restored three times with intensity. You know, three represents the Holy Trinity, completeness and finality. It's a Semitic emphatic triplet. That's what it is. Many times it's used, the number three in the Bible, to describe not only something, but the intensity of it, the completeness of it. And so when this happened three times, he goes, Some, somebody was trying to tell me something intense, something complete, something I need to pay attention to. Like a Semitic triplet, uh, for instance, what is that? It's not only a fact or a truth, but it's an emphatic intensity of that. Did you ever see the, anybody say, God is holy? Uh, it says, holy is God. It doesn't say that. It says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Anytime that three thing happens. And so Peter's going, what the world's going on? And um, while he's doing that, uh, while he's doing that, uh, and Cornelius is over there wondering and waiting, the three men are knocking at the door, and while he's doing it, the Holy Spirit says to Peter, three men, there's that three again, they're here to get you, go with them. So Peter, still wondering, it says him with himself, like, what is going on here? Notice, though, he followed the Holy Spirit, even though he went like, what? Did you ever feel that in your life? Like, I'm headed this way, but it feels a little uncertain, but inside you just know, uh, I just, I just, I got to keep going. So he goes with them, and he comes to Cornelius in a house full of Gentiles, people who had no right to the gospel outside the commonwealth of Israel, and they said, we're here to listen to your message of the good news. And Peter does what he always did. He says, but I'm not supposed to be here. And he starts his sermon in the most demotivating way. He says to him, you know, I'm really not supposed to be here and you're not really included. What if I told you all, you know, you're not supposed to, I'm gonna to preach to you this morning, but you're really not supposed to be here. It's not available to you, but I suppose I'll tell you anyhow. I mean, what would that do? It didn't matter, he was so hesitant. But he starts preaching in verse 44, it says, while he was just started preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on everybody, they're all saved. And all the witnesses, he brought circumcised believers, Jewish people who had been circumcised, hardcore Christians and circumcised Jews, to make sure that if anything weird happens, I got witnesses. It says they were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit were poured out on the Gentiles. They heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Same old thing, same old thing, a sign that something had happened. By the way, I think we need that sign come back today, that that is a witness a strong witness of being saved, settled, sealed. Notice that was a thing. It's not a doctrine, but it's a pretty cool thing to note. Peter said, surely nobody can stand in the way of these people being baptized. They got everything else, and so they baptized everybody. And get this, the church at Jerusalem is freaking out because all the Gentiles, the uncircumcised outside of Israel are all getting saved and they don't know what to do about it. And they pull Peter in and go, what is going on? And Acts 11, Peter says, 
This is what happened as I began to speak. The Holy Spirit fell on everybody like he did on us. And I remember that the, the, what the Lord said, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I to think I could stand in God's way? How do you stop that? When they heard this, they had no further objections, and they praised God, saying, this is so huge, so then, even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Church, this is a huge point, a huge point, because those Gentiles are you and the rest of the whole world. Up to that point, everyone, as Paul said in Colossians, you were strangers to the commonwealth of Israel and the covenants of promise, but now you, who are far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who has broken down the wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. That is the law and the commandments. He fulfilled it, did away with it, ushered in a whole new system so he can make the two both one into one new man. So this is huge, huge, huge. And then this also begins for all of us to understand. We wonder where we are in history this huge point because this begins what the Bible calls the time of the Gentiles. In Luke chapter 21 verse 24, Jesus said the gospel of the kingdom will be preached through the whole world. It says in Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles till the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. This was a 2,000 year period approximately of grace where God was going to make the gospel beyond the Jewish nation and its covenant available to the whole world, to anyone who would listen anyone up to that time it had not been true until that time was fulfilled until the time of the gentiles is over do you know this the time of the gentiles is almost over in 1948 israel became a nation in 1967 they won back in the six-day war all the property they had lost and for the first time in almost 2,000 years 1900 and some years jerusalem was under the control of the Israelis back to the Jew and you know what Jerusalem the time of the Gentiles uh, through this time the Word of God's gone all through the world and there are many people groups yet that still have to hear but we are living in the end of the age there is a fresh move a final harvest blast of the Holy Spirit that I can feel on the ground floor and I've been through a, a number of them this is a huge one church I've been at it for 50 years I am telling you, there is a massive wave of the Holy Spirit, and we need to be all in, lock, stock, and barrel, like they were, because it's happening again. And it's going to involve full commitment and just throwing ourselves into the grace of God and throwing ourselves into the fray, and something awesome will happen. And uh, meanwhile, at this key moment, can you imagine what the church felt like? Not just the Jews anymore, but the whole world now. The last thrust of the gospel. Meanwhile, while all this is going on and they're all excited, Saul is on the war path. I'm taking a few extra minutes today, but I want you to, to get this thing. Saul's on the war path. Persecution is going on in Jerusalem, and now Saul is so mad. He goes, I'm going to stamp out Christianity. I'm going to kill, jail, separate until Christianity is stomped out. He's on the war path in reverse. Judaism is, must be preserved. And, uh, and, 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 and he got letters to Damascus. I'm going to go to other cities where the gospel is being preached. I'm going to stamp it out. Meanwhile, in, the, in heaven, I like to imagine, this is me imagining, this probably didn't happen this way, but in my mind, the Holy Trinity's up there, and they're going, well, now we're making the gospel available to the whole world. It, our plan's in place, the patriarchs, Israel, the Messiah, now the New Testament church, and now the Holy Spirit's there representing Jesus through the lives of many believers, and they're doing many different works than he could, more than he could, because they're everywhere but now we're going to touch the whole world. Who can we get to spearhead this? We're down one apostle because Judas hanged himself. He didn't turn out so good. We need another one. They voted for Matthias, cast lots and drew straws, but that's not really how I do things. Hmm, we need a guy to do it. God says, I know what we do. Let's pick the number one persecutor of the church, a number one Pharisee, a bitter legalistic Jew who's half Gentile, who's opposed to everything we're doing, let's pick him to do it. I love who God picks sometimes. 
to do stuff. You may be one of those guys. I don't have a word for you, but I just had a feeling there's an opposition person in one of these services that God is going to slam dunk you so bad that what you are against, you are going to become so poor that people are going to wonder what happened to him. Who are you? Because you're out there. If you're watching by live stream, I want to meet you after you change. And, um, um, so get this. I'm not joking, by the way, even though we're having a little fun. I can see the Trinity. They're talking amongst themselves. God says, and Jesus goes, this is a good idea. Let's get Saul to do it. Let's do it. I mean, my blood can change destiny. It can change history. We can change that self-righteous, legalistic clown, and we can turn him into a dynamo for the gospel. I know we In fact... I like your idea, God, so much. Holy Spirit, you're the one representing me all over the world, but I want to do this one myself. I just, I just I'm going to be, I want to handle Paul myself, and then I'll turn it back over to you. And so Paul's riding down the road, and the Holy Spirit goes, okay. Now, I understand this is very broken down, and some theologian on Wretched Radio will hear this and tear me to pieces. But I don't care. I could care less. Here's what's funny, is... Paul's riding down to Damascus. He's got letters. He's got authority. He's driven by the law, legalistic, self-righteous Pharisee, and he's mad. All legalistic, self-righteous people are mad. They're not happy. And we're right, thank you very much. I better be careful. He goes, hey, Saul! And he takes a laser light and Saul's, he sees it. It's so blinding, it blinds him. He knocks him off his horse and he's laying there and go, who are you, Lord? He had the sense to say, Lord, he knew. <laughs> and, and he says, I'm Jesus. Thank you very much, the one you're persecuting. By the way, it's hard to kick against the pricks and you are one. And, I, and you know what? Radically, he meets the risen Lord in a divine thing. He's blinded, so he's helpless in this world. He ends up on Straight Street, which is the new straight he, street he's going to live on. And God sends a disciple, and Saul is saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, healed, and redirected in a different direction. And he is literally turned inside out, upside down. And you know what Saul does? He's on a new mission. You know what he does the minute he gets all this together? He goes to the synagogue and he starts talking to the Jews, the very one whose side he was on. And he said to them, I was really wrong. I made a huge mistake. Jesus knocked me off my high horse. How many of you have been knocked off your high horse? Come on, can I hear it from you? You've been knocked off your horse. You've been repositioned to become one of his ministers. And he preached the gospel to him, and they got so mad, they go, we're going to kill you. And the hunter became the hunted. And they shipped him off to Tarshish. He hid. They went back to Jerusalem and said, look, this guy is cool now. And then they shipped him off because they knew everybody wanted to kill him. And he spent out three or more years in Tarshish, where God spoke to him, taught him about Christ in the Old Testament and then caught him up into the third heaven and gave him visions and, and revelations of things to come that he, that he poured out and wrote one third of the New Testament with a bloody back and chains and finally gave his life. Uh, but here's the thing. Fast forward. As time went on, Paul, Saul becomes Paul, <laughs> who means little, and, and he is chosen to break the gospel he, to the Gentile world. Appointed through prayer, fasting, and the Holy Spirit. He's sent to the Gentile. He goes to Antioch. It became official. The first city that they went to, Antioch, uh, close to over about two, three-year period, uh, 500 plus believers were born again. Most of that city were slaves and poor. It set up to 70% of the city was poor and in slavery. Very few rich people. Uh, and, and this is where the gospel broke out. And at Antioch's the first place that believers were called Christians. But here's where the official thing happens. I'm almost done here. Uh, it, it happened and it became official that everybody knew it at Antioch. You know what they did? They went first to the Jew, because the Bible says to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, 
and as many as the Lord our God shall call. So Paul said, well, I'm going to go to the Jew first, and he went to the Sabbath, and it says on verse chapter, uh, verse 44 of Acts 13, the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. They couldn't even fit in the synagogue, and the Jews saw the crowd. They were filled with jealousy, began to contradict what Paul was saying, heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered boldly and said, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Because that's how it is. But since you reject it and you do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. And so it began, the final thrust to the ends of the earth. And literally seven and a half years later, at this point, 12 years have transpired. And seven years later, seven years later, it's actually six and a half years later, all Seven powerful churches had been planted throughout Asia, Asia Minor. Galatia, <laughs> Corinth, the Ephesians, Iconium, Lystra, uh, all these places had church plants in them. And the gospel literally went to the ends of the earth. There weren't near as many people as there are now. And there was outposts for the gospel in all these different places. At the thrust to the ends of the earth and a whole new breed of crazy, uncircumcised, unscrupulous, formerly idol-worshipping pagans who didn't know anything about Moses, the law, the tabernacle, anything related to Israel, became on fire, saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, had no sense of religious background whatsoever. And the story of what happened is ridiculous. It was a lot different than before. <laughs> and um, a couple of different things here. What did they have to go on? One simple thing. Jesus. Who he was, what he said. Paul says, I determined to know nothing but Jesus and him crucified. And I'm telling you, the law of Moses wasn't even in the books. That system had been done away with, nailed to the cross. It was the thing that separated the Jew from the Gentile, and a whole new law came into being. It was the law, Romans 8, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You're born again. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Now all you have to do is follow Jesus. And the disciples gave many, many, many principles and commands from everything they had learned with Jesus. And they sat with their pens taking notes like crazy. By the way, don't worry about the Ten Commandments. Worry about from the first of Matthew till the book of Peter. Look up everything Jesus just said we should do to cooperate with his teachings. And you will find over 300 things that he says to do. And if we do those just as the Holy Spirit leads, listen to our conscience, there was nothing to listen or read in those days. But you will find if you, if you did that, if you listened to their teaching and followed Jesus and the unction of the Holy Spirit inside you, you would find yourself living way beyond the law, fulfilling it much more so you didn't even need the law because the perfect love that comes from the Holy Spirit inside you, following the conscience and the teachings of Jesus, is all you need to do to become just like him. And today we no longer follow 10 externals. They're there. They're the basis of civil law. But there's a new law. It's whatever the Holy Spirit is leading you to do and become every day, 24-7. And we see something emerge, which I'll talk about next week. I'm going to release on you a Gentile evangelist to the pagans. Someone who's not very churchy. I'm going to turn him loose on you. And you're going to feel something different, but it's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And we're going to talk about it. And then I'm going to finish up the following week what it was like in those days. Uh, you're, you're, you're going to be amazed where I take this thing and what happens in the next couple weeks. I'm going to read to you from the Timothy Diaries. And I'm going to read about the Gentiles and the Judaizers. The classic battle between law and grace is just getting started. And it continues to this day. What is the challenge to us? What is the challenge to us? We'll get on with that. And before it's done, you will see very clearly how we are to live, the new path we're to follow, the unction of the Holy Spirit inside us, and how to live. I'm hoping and believing that each time we spend time together, it'll move you a little further into the kingdom lane where you'll be so all in that you'll say, like Paul, I count everything in this life dung. 
except to know Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. He says that I can be conformed to his death and that it's no longer me who lives. I'm crucified with Christ. And the life I knew, I don't even remember anymore except that Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When that happens, church, there will be such a blast of holy fire and power and grace that comes from us and surrounding communities. It'll touch an entire region and affect a country. It's my prayer that we will be part of that move. We'll be part of that move. As we close today, I want to say this. What is the gospel anyhow? When they went and preached the gospel, what is the gospel anyhow? Gospel means good news. What's the good news? The good news is that whether you live in a trailer or a mansion, you're old or young, rich or poor, empty, dead, alone, you have everything in the world and you're still unfulfilled, or you have nothing and you're unfulfilled, you can get off that train and you can become a follower of Jesus Christ. You can become part of the family of God. You can tap into an eternal plan that was made before you were born by him for you. Have eternal life. Have your sins washed away. Get a band of brothers and sisters and a huge God dysfunctional family that will go on not only through time and into eternity. And you can become just like the most dynamic, awesome person in the whole universe and have everything that he has living inside you and it'll only get better for the next trillion years and there will be no time. This is the message, this is the good news. You can get off the death train and the downward spiral and have eternal life and a purpose for living that will never stop. Church, I call that good news.